All right, hello everybody, and today we're gonna be having a look at how we can define the sign of matrix. So we're gonna be dealing with two by two matrices in this video, but you can extend it out to any n by n matrix you want. So before we get into this example right here, we wanna take a look at a more general case, namely the sign of just some, any random matrix, let's call it A. Okay, and we're gonna let A be a two by two matrix. And what we want A to be is we want A to be a diagonalizable matrix. So if A is a diagonalizable matrix, we can decompose it into the form A is equal to PDP inverse. So we have our D as our diagonal matrix right here. And the nice thing about doing that is we can define powers of A. So if we have A raised to the nth power, for example, so A raised to the n, then all we really need to do is raise this diagonal matrix to the nth power as well. So if we have this nice formula right here, if we have A being a diagonalizable matrix, and we can actually extend this further a little bit, let's define D as some random two by two matrix with entries D1, 0, 0, and D2. If we have our matrix D raises some power N, what we actually do is we actually raise these entries to the nth power as well. You can prove this quite easily using some matrix multiplication. But uh, let's actually substitute this into here. And we have A to the N being equal to P times this matrix, this diagonal matrix. So D1 to the N, 0, 0, D2 to the N, and P inverse. And what is the point of doing this? Why do we want to know how to define powers of matrices? Well, you see our sine function right here, we can actually express it in terms of a power series. So if we have, let's say, sine of some variable x, then we can write this in terms of its power series or Maclaurin series, which is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n, x to the 2n plus one over 2n plus one factorial. That's the um, power series expansion for our sine of x right here. And remember, we want to define the sine of a matrix. So if we have a matrix as our argument of our sine function, then it should be reasonable that if we want to define sine of A, we just need to replace these X's with A's. So we have sine of A, and instead of this X here, we have an A. And you see right here, we have A raised to some power. And that's exactly why we want to know how to define powers of our matrix A. So you see here we have A raised to 2n plus one. So if we have A raised to 2n plus one instead, what we actually do, if we can decompose into our diagonal form right here, we just raise our diagonal entries right here to the 2n plus 1 power. So now, why not plug all of this stuff into the sum in place of our a to the 2n plus 1? And while I'm doing that, I'm actually going to bring this p and this p inverse out to the front and back of the sum respectively, because these p's right here, they don't have n's in them. They're not dependent on n. And we also have to preserve the order of them, our matrices right here because these are still matrices. We're still dealing with matrices in this expression. So if we do all of that replacement right there, we have sine of a being equal to p, so this first matrix, times infinite sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n. And then I'm actually going to divide by 2n plus one factorial. And I'm going to put this matrix in right now. So we have D1 to the 2n plus one, zero to zero, D2 to the 2n plus one, and end it off with a P inverse. All right, and now what I'm going to do, notice that we have a matrix right here and we have some stuff on the outside multiplied into this matrix. So why not bring all of this stuff into our matrix. So whenever you have something multiplied by our matrix, all you do is multiply this something that's out here into each of these entries right here. So if we multiply all of that in, we have P times the infinite sum from n equals zero to infinity of, now we have a big matrix, and then we have negative one to the n, D1 to the 2n plus one over 2n plus one factorial, zero, zero, negative one to the n, d2 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial and p inverse. Notice one cool thing right here. 
these entries right here, these diagonal entries, they kind of look like what we have right here, but instead of having A, we have D1 and D2. But we're just missing something a little bit, namely the sum, because once we have the sum inside of these entries right here, we can express it as the sign of something. But the nice thing is, we have a sum right here on the outside of our matrix and notice that we're summing a bunch of matrices together and when you sum matrices together what you're actually doing is you're summing each of these entries together as well so out here we were summing a bunch of matrices from n equals 0 to infinity that means equivalently we're also summing each of these entries in our matrix from n equals 0 to infinity as well and we can forget about these zeros because they're just zero so pretty much what we can do, we can move this sum right here, this infinite sum, into our matrix, into each of the entries of our matrix. So if we do that, all we're going to get is P times matrix, and we have the sum running from n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, d1 to the 2n plus 1, over 2n plus 1 factorial, 0, 0, and another infinite sum from 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, d2 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial and we have the p inverse of the n and this matrix right here is quite nice because notice these diagonal entries right here they're actually the power series expansion of our sine of x but evaluated at d1 and d2 because notice that these sums match the actual power series expansion of our sine of a but instead of having A, we have D1 and D2. That means we can simplify all of this stuff down to P times the sine of whatever is right here, which is D1. So sine of D1, 0, 0, and the sine of this thing right here, which is D2, and P inverse. So right here, this is the sine of our matrix A we wanted to find. So overall, we found our little formula for the sine of a matrix. If we want to take the sine of A, then if we can diagonalize A into PDP inverse, then the sine of A is just this diagonalized form, but we're taking the sine of its diagonal entries. So that's pretty much our little formula for defining the sine of a matrix. Now onto this example right here. All right, so we have this matrix right here. Let's actually call this matrix um, A for now. So we want to find the sine of A. So first of all, we need to diagonalize our matrix A. So to diagonalize A, we need to find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So let's start off with the eigenvalues. So to find those, we need to take the determinant of the matrix lambda I minus our A. And what exactly is that? Well, that's the determinant of our matrix lambda i minus a. So first of all, in this entry, we have lambda minus 2 pi over 3. So lambda minus 2 pi over 3. And then 0 minus pi over 3 is minus pi over 3. And then 0 minus pi over 6 is minus pi over 6. Then we have a lambda minus a down here. So lambda minus 5 pi over 6. And we actually want to solve for where that equals to 0. Okay, so computing the determinant of this, not, nothing too hard there. So lambda minus 2 pi over 3, lambda minus 5 pi over 6, so that's AD. Then we need to subtract BC, so minus, this times that's going to be a positive number, and then we're going to have pi squared over 18, okay? And to solve where this thing equals to 0, let's actually expand out this part right here. So this is equal to... Or equivalent to saying lambda squared minus 2 pi over 3 lambda so multiplying these two together now the outside so minus um, 5 pi over 6 lambda then um, and these two terms right here multiplied together we're going to get 10 pi squared over 18 and then I'm going to subtract pi squared over 18 and we want to solve where that equals to 0 so notice right here we have a common factor of pi squared over 18 so we have 10 of those minus one of those, so that gives us nine of those. So we're gonna have nine over 18 times pi squared, which is exactly pi squared over two. And down here, we're still gonna have our lambda squared. And we want a common denominator of six, so let's multiply this through by two. So we're gonna have six and a four up here, that's still two thirds. So minus four minus five, that's minus nine pi over six lambda and then right here we said those um plus pi squared over two 
and solve for that equals to zero. Nine over six, that's three halves. And well, to solve this quadratic equation right here, we can kind of factorize this a little bit. So I want to think of two numbers that multiply to pi squared over two, and those two numbers must add to three pi over two. So let's actually first forget about these pi's right here. We want two numbers that add to negative three halves, and those two need to multiply to a half. And maybe the two numbers you think about are negative a half and to negative one, because negative half minus one is negative three halves. Multiply those two together, we're gonna to get a half. So we can actually factorize this into pi minus um, one half pi and lambda minus pi. And if you expand that out, you should get this equation right here, and that equals to zero. So our solutions for um, our lambda right here, are lambda is equal to pi, or lambda is equal to pi over two. So those right here are our eigenvalues, and now to find our eigenvectors. All right, so first of all, let's find the eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals to pi. So to do that, we need to plug pi into this matrix right here and take the null space of that matrix. So we're finding the null space of the matrix. Uh, let's see, we have pi minus two pi over three, that's exactly one pi over three. And then this stays the same, so minus pi over three. And then we have minus pi over six. And then a pi minus five pi over six, that's exactly pi over six. All right, so what can we do right here? Let's actually multiply the bottom by two. So if we do that, we're gonna change these to threes right here. And notice we have pi and threes in all these entries right here. So what I'm actually gonna do, I'm gonna add the top row to the bottom row. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna cancel out the bottom because pi and three minus pi and three is zero and vice versa. So those are gonna turn into zero and I'm gonna divide the top row by pi and three to get us one and negative one. So if you think about what this null space actually means, it's getting the matrix one, negative one, zero, zero, and multiplying by some vector x, y, and we wanna find the vector x, y that gives us the zero vector under this transformation right here. And if you think about this as some kind of system of equations, you're gonna get the equation x, so x right here, minus y is equal to zero, okay? And while solving for this is easy, it just means that x is equal to y, and if x is equal to y, that means this vector we're finding, so this vector x, y, that's equal to x, x, for example. And as well, we can bring out this x, and then we're gonna have x times one, one, and notice x is some free variable. It really doesn't matter what x is. That means we're gonna get the span of our vector, one, one, and the vector one, one is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue of lambda equals to pi. So we've found one of our eigenvectors, which is nice. So the vector corresponding to um, pi is the vector one, one. And now to find our eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals pi and two. And we just need to do, it, do the exact same process, plugging pi and two into this matrix and finding the null space of that. So we're trying to find the null space of the matrix. So pi and two, plug it into here. So we're trying to find pi on two minus two pi over three. So let's actually get this onto a common denominator. So if you multiply this by two, so four over six, and this by three, so three over six, we have three minus four, which is exactly negative one. So we're gonna have negative pi over six, and then here we're gonna have negative pi over three, and right here, we're going to get negative pi over six still. And right here, if you plug um, pi over two into here, let's see, pi over two minus five pi over six. Let's multiply this by three. So three, three, three minus five, that's exactly negative two. So we're gonna have negative two pi over six, which actually simplifies down to negative pi over three. Okay, so we're trying to find the null space of this matrix right here. So what we can actually do, notice that this row is exactly this row. So we can subtract the um, top from the bottom to get rid of this bottom row completely. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't do anything. So we have zero, zero right here. And right here on this top row, let's multiply by negative one, get rid of those negatives. And what I'm actually going to do now, let's multiply this top row by six. So if we do that, we're going to get pi up here and six times pi and three is exactly two pi. 
And so now what we're going to do is divide this top row by, by two. So we're going to have one and two. And right here we have this matrix right here. And again, just like before, what does this null space of this matrix mean? It, it means that we have the transformation one, two, zero, zero, multiplied by some vector x, y, giving us the zero vector. And well, thinking about this as some kind of system of equations, you're going to get x plus 2y, so x plus 2y is equal to zero. And so well, solving this for, let's say, x, so that means x is equal to negative 2y, that means the vector x, y we're looking for is negative 2y and it's y, and we can pull the y out, so this becomes y negative 2, 1, and so y is our free variable in this case, so this just becomes the span of this vector right here, which is negative 2 and 1. So negative 2, 1 is a eigenvector corresponding to our eigenvalue of pi over 2. So we have that um, part figured out. So we have uh, negative 2 and 1 like so. And with all of that out of the way, we've found our eigenvectors and eigenvalues. We can finally put everything together and express our a right here in its diagonalized form. So now we have our a right here being PDP inverse. And what exactly is our P? Well, our P is just our matrix of eigenvectors. So we have 1, 1 and negative 2, 1. So 1, 1, negative 2, 1. And our D matrix is just our corresponding diagonal matrix. So we put this vector first. That means we're going to put our pi first. So we have pi, 0, 0. And we put this vector second. So we have pi and 2 that's left. So pi over 2. And then we have to figure out P inverse. So P inverse... Let's compute the determinant of this thing right here. So we have AD minus BC, so 1 minus negative 2, which is exactly 3. So now to do the inverse for this matrix, we're switching these two entries right here. So that still says the same, 1, 1. And we negate these two entries. So we have 2 and negative 1. And our determinant was 3, so we divide it by the determinant, which is 3. So we get this thing right here. Stupid dog barking outside, let me close the door. All right, so we have this expression for A right now. So now we can finally compute the sine of A. So our sine of our matrix A. Remember from the formula we had, if we want to compute sine of A, we just diagonalize our A matrix right here, which we have done. And we just take sine of these diagonal entries right here. So uh, we still have our 1, negative 2, 1, 1. And then we have sine of pi, but sine of pi is exactly zero. And these zeros will stay as they are. And sine of pi over two is exactly one. So now our matrix is turned into this thing right here. And we still have a third, two thirds, negative a third, a third. Okay, and now all we really have to do now is multiply all of this stuff together. So if we do that, we're going to get one negative two, one, one. Once playing these two together, um, the first two entries right here should be zero because the top row is zero. So you have zero, zero. And then we're going to have, um, yeah, negative a third and positive a third. And multiplying those two matrices together, we should get, well, this is negative two times negative one, which is two. So two thirds, negative two thirds, negative one third, and finally one third. So this matrix right here is the sign of our matrix A. So overall, in the end, we found that um, the sign of that matrix right there, that matrix at the top, is exactly equal to two thirds, negative two thirds, negative third, and one third. And that is our final answer for today's video. So yep, hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see everyone next time.